Hello! The 80th episode of BZ Listening with a very special returning guest, Curtis Eller. Uh, my name is BZ Douglas, and you know, over the years, I've worn a lot of hats. These days, I typically introduce myself as an independent journalist based in Cleveland, Ohio, covering police abuse, prosecutorial misconduct, all that fun stuff. Um, but when I met Curtis back in, in uh, uh, when I interviewed him the first time in 2014, I was just a, a local musician who got to book one of my musical heroes for a quirky little house show I was putting together. And I thought interviewing him would be a pretty, you know, a cool way to get to know him better, but also, you know, fun to, you know, hopefully promote the show I was having him in. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to bring you this and I'm not going to go on long with this little pre-intro, but before we get to the, uh, the actual interview, I wanted to announce that I've got two tickets to give away to see Curtis here in Cleveland on Saturday, July 15th at the whiz Bang Circus School and, and Theater, uh, a pretty incredible place right around the corner from me. And uh, if you would like to enter in this little sweepstakes to get tickets, uh, just share this episode somewhere on social media and follow Curtis on whatever social media you're on. You'll find episode links in the description. Uh, then you can just send me a link of you sharing something or a screenshot to bzlistening at gmail.com. Uh, it's just like it sounds, but it's written in the description and should be have been floating around somewhere on here if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, all of my Patreon supporters will automatically be entered. It's one of those perks you get if you sign up. Uh, I think that was a really creepy wink. Thankfully, if you're listening, you didn't see that. Um, but uh, if, if for whatever reason... You uh, you do win the sweepstakes and you can't make it. I hope you have a friend somewhere in Cleveland that you would like to give them to and make them a, into a Curtis Eller fan. Or you can be gracious, relinquish, you know, say pass. We'll draw someone else's name. And the winners will be announced on uh, July 12th. And the, I think, is there anything else I need to do? I haven't done a lot of sweepstakes, but I think that's everything, how you enter, when, when you'll find out if you win. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing whoever it is that, that gets these tickets when I, I go with my wife. Saturday, July 15th, it's going to be an incredible show. There's quite, there's just nothing like seeing Curtis Eller live. I'm a fanboy. You can tell. I'm wearing his t-shirt in the interview. It's that bad. So um, check out the description for links to support and follow Curtis. You can find uh, all of the songs that I've used in this episode in there as well. So thank you so much for listening. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with Curtis Eller as much as I enjoyed having t talking. I'm, I'm good at talking. I'm a podcaster. To any Curtis Eller fans out there, you know, we're all family. It's a beautiful thing, like finding, like when you go to a Curtis Eller show and A, if you're someone next to you who doesn't know uh, what they're in for, it's cool to watch them experience it for the first time. And for those who know, we're all like, ah, you know about Curtis Eller, that's great. So um, with all that out of the way, uh, the, the last preface I'll just say is, yeah, go back, listen to uh, on this podcast, I think it's like episode two or three, um, but it was from way back in 2014, and I'm really excited to catch up with you, Curtis. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing quite uh, quite good, considering uh, the state of the world. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's on my list to get to. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I kind of wanted, I you know, I. I at the top here, while I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, contextualizing myself and my relationship to you, um, you're one of the two artists, and it's interesting, like, you know, I went back and re-listened to that first interview just so I know not to cover some of the same things, um, and I hadn't listened to it a while, and there was a lot of it that I was just like, oh, man, yeah, that was, I, I, you know, hearing your perspective on how and why you perform the way you do, um, what, you know, 
the stories behind the songs and the stories you tell on stage. And um, you and uh, I, I would say for every artist that I've had on this show, I'm like rooting for your success, but I, none more so than you um, on a way that I'm just like, I, I, I I've, I've thought like it would be good. It would say a lot of good to me about America if we raised you up as, as a, a popular, well-known artist, you know, that would make <laughs> me feel comfortable about where we are as a country that we're celebrating right. and making sure someone like you is part of as much a part of the American music canon as Woody Guthrie or Pete Seeger. And, you know, uh, some of the people I know that, that matter a lot to you. Um, and oh, just being your own that. thing, not even being like, oh, you're this new neo version of this iconoclast. Um, and, you know, I've seen with uh, my other first guest was Charlie Crockett. And I interviewed oh, yeah. both of you right around the time I was having my little variety show and you guys were both playing one of them. And I was like, oh, that's when I was like, I'll try this out interviewing my my get or my my featured acts. And Charlie yeah. is he's gotten really big. Explode. He's really taken. Off. Yeah. yeah. And it's I Great. was talking about this at an open mic recently about, you know, my relationship to music as far as pursuing it professionally, because I'm very satiated, just like playing in open mics, getting little gigs thrown at me. And I love playing live. I love that. I'm intimidated by the idea of, uh, as you said, like playing live is like a play. And we're recording is like making a movie. And right. that, that process I think of still, I haven't waded into that yet. But I look at like the fact that like, you know, Charlie found that success and he just threw, he did nothing but music for like and 10 years. And it was scrounging, it was busking and doing all this stuff and going all over the place. And then back to his roots and throwing himself at it and seeing how much like you have been you found music so early and what a difficult journey it is to be a professional musician. And, um, yeah, it's, it's rough. <laughs> and we're, we're like, you know, there's no like, well, if you do these things, you'll be good. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not like having a job where you put in your time and do what you're supposed to do when you get a raise and you get a promotion. And it's like every single day, day and every hour of every day you're filling out a new resume and trying to prove trying to get a job every moment of you know um so and it goes up and down you know you sometimes you hit a hot streak and everything's going great i hit a hot streak right before the pandemic hit and then that got taken away <laughs> And that's so, what I wanted to um, I definitely wanted to, you know, talk about that because, um, yeah, I think prior to the pandemic, I'd be talking to you about like what, you know, what are the obstacles you've faced um, in professional music? Like what is what is the um, way that you're carving out a, a path to building an audience? And then the pandemic happens. And so how did you get through that? Well, I had not played a lot right coming up to it because I was kind of saving myself because in starting in April of 2020, I was we got a headlining gig at the uh, uh, National Australian Folk Festival. Um, so we had built a tour around that. So I was supposed to do... Th three weeks with the full band in Australia. And then we were going to hit England, Scotland, Holland, Belgium, and then a solo tour of the American West coast. So I had a hundred gigs lined up and then obviously April, 2020 was not a good time to be starting. So I, it just like every musician, I watched them fall like, very unpleasant dominoes. And I immediately said, well, this is why I do what I do. You know, banjo players are supposed to see people through hard times. <laughs> so 
I was like, well, I got the technology, so I figured out how to start making videos on my phone. And I did one every day for three months or something. Um, just one song that seemed to have relevance to <clears throat> relevance to what had happened that week with the pandemic or politically. And I, I called them fireside chats because I was like, oh, these are my way of making people feel better. And people started watching them and sharing them and even doing their own versions of those songs, which felt good. And then after a couple of weeks of that, I started doing a weekly live stream. And I did it on Mondays at 5 o'clock because I figured that was happy hour in America and rock and roll hour in Europe. So I got really great combining of the different audiences. I typically I go out on tour and there's the 50 people in every town that dig what I'm doing. But in the early year of the pandemic, it was so great to watch every, everybody in Amsterdam and London and Manchester and Detroit and New York and Carolina all watching together and communicating with each other in the comments. So it created a, a community that didn't naturally exist. So I've been very grateful for the technology that made me feel really connected to everybody. I felt like I was doing some good. Um, you know, so I, I spent a couple of years live streaming at least once, sometimes several times a week, and uh, really honestly felt connected. A lot of musicians I know said it felt, how can I just sing to my phone or computer and feel like it's a real performance? But for some reason, I honestly felt like I was singing to people, and it kept me from going totally insane. And people were very generous with the tips and stuff. So it worked. But now I'm tired of it. <laughs> Rough times. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready for this shit to be over. I'm looking for hope. Anywhere I can find it. Even in the worst of times, factory fires, civil war, presidential assassination, there's always little flakes of hope, like rust on the undercarriage. This is a song of hope in the key of F minor. I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire. I'm climbing up into the rafters. I'm gonna clip that angel's wire. I'm gonna lock the factory doors and let them sweep the ashes away. If you was holding out for the union to save you, I guess you just turned up on a bad day. Cause this time I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire. And I'm getting drunk. Like Ulysses S. Grant I'm going down to Antietam With a quarter bourbon in my hand Well, I'm gonna kick the shit out of Vicksburg Strip the silver from that dime 
You'd better hope that the Confederacy come to its senses before I start drinking because this time I'm gonna get fucked up like Ulysses S. Grant. And I'm caving in like a Pittsburgh mine. Just as black as a Tuesday in 1929 Well, don't you know I'm gonna shake it Like I was from Memphis, Tennessee And when the timbers start to rattle And the walls come down There ain't no two below midnight Got nothing on me Well, this time I'm caving in like a Pittsburgh mine And just as sure as Jack Ruby's gonna set things right Well, there's always daybreak at the edge of night And this time I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire of the year I'm giving up on the church like I was never even here I'm gonna sink down in the springtime and burn out the roots like a frost Yeah, I'm gonna sink down in the springtime and burn out the roots like a frost. I'm gonna leave the county at the mercy of the salt trucks. This heart is as black as any union bus. Well, I'm gonna sink down like a frost. I'm gonna burn out the roots. Sure as Jack Ruby's gonna set things right Well, there's always daybreak at the edge of night And this time I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire 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 yeah, I'm gonna burn I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire I'm gonna burn like a sweatshop fire Go out and find some rust. I'll see you next time. So what has performing post-pandemic been like? You're mid-tour right now, correct? Uh, I'm about to start. You're about to start. Um, okay, yeah. I didn't know where you were at. Because you're going to be in town real soon here. And that's the reason I wanted to have you yeah. on. Yeah. Make sure everybody that listens to me comes sees you if they're here in, in the Cleveland area. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I... um. The post-pandemic world, it's been rather scattered, you know, um, gigs can come up and get canceled really easy. Um, venues will close. I was supposed to be playing in Pittsburgh and the venue closed. So that's off the table, but, um, at first there was a lot of outdoor performances and it used to be when festival season came around i was like great we get to play outside it's gonna be wonderful and now i'm like get me in a dark smelly punk rock shithole please 
<laughs> like I just want to be done with the sun for a while. Um, so it's it's nice to get back in the folk clubs and rock and roll clubs. Um, um, this coming up this month, July, I'm doing a solo tour of Michigan and Ohio, which feels like a homecoming in a way because I'm from Detroit originally, uh, suburban Detroit. And so I'm playing Kalamazoo and Lansing, Michigan, and uh, uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, which is a little town near, uh, near Ann Arbor where I used to live. And I'm doing uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and then a house concert in Kent, Ohio, which I think is kind of like a suburb of Akron, right? Yeah, they're, they have the, the decent college there, Kent State. Uh, so it's a college. Oh, that's college. where Kent State is. Yeah. Of course it is. Obviously, I didn't, and, and of the historical tragic significance, but I, I do know people yeah. from, they have a good fashion program and a good, yeah, they're a decent yeah. college. Ah, I mean, it's funny to me, Devo. <laughs> Went to Kent State, and they were there when that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just listening which, to a long interview with uh, one of them about, yeah, their Mark whole, Mother's their whole arc as a band. Yeah. I mean, you were saying what's different about post-pandemic. It's the volatility of things. And even within the band, you know, my drummer has a, a partner who is immunocompromised. So he, he's been extremely worried about getting out there. So when well, that's the, the thing, we're not post pandemic, right? No, not at My all. My mom like just it. got COVID for the first time this week. She's weathering it fine, but she's, you know, had like the full battery of vaccinations, but yeah, there's people who can't get them. Um, and, and even if they can, it's still going to be a problem and it's, there is no post pandemic yet, really it, a lot of, and you know, what? I honestly think there never will be No, that window closed. It's just how, at this point, do we interface with it? So I thought of it, I just needed, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I, I, when the pandemic happened, it, it was like, oh, this is like nine 11, but happening in slow motion in terms of an event it felt like. that is transformed. Like, whereas nine 11 was like, boom, it happened. We're in, sh it's like getting a gunshot wound. Right. Whereas yeah. like the pandemic was like, yeah. When it started coming out, like, Oh, we just got a diagnosis of cancer and yeah, we could do a thing where, but Nope. It got to the point where we, at the end, we, you know, lost a limb and now we have to be a lot more careful about all kinds of things we do. And it, but it was transformative yeah. on, on a lot of levels. Um, yeah, it, it, it changed everything. And I, early on, I had this idea, oh, this is going to be our sort of World War II moment where we all gather together and, you know, and come together and look after one another and maybe change the way we operate moving forward. And that was a really wonderful 45 minutes to think that. <laughs> and then it all went south. But uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of musicians. I mean, it get, got to the point where for myself and a lot of other people, it just got to be, I've not worked in going on three years. So I need to get out there. Now, have you found I, with the, the bits of gigs you've done, like in terms of, you know, for, for being post pandemic in terms of live performances being verboten, um, yeah, now they're happening and the people who are, are able to go to them, they're really like thankful for it, you know, um, and appreciative. And I recently went to a music festival, probably would have been your vibe. A lot of great bands, uh, called pyro fest happens several oh, times cool. over the year. Um, band rising Appalachia. You. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I know them. Uh, they're another Carolina band. Um, that's who brought us my, there. yeah, my harmony singer, Stacy, she, uh, she's a huge fan of, of that group. Um, not surprised. I mean, as a harmony singer, you would be, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're about as good as it gets. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, one for me, one of the sad things, I've been playing with the band a bit around here, but I'm sort of afraid to book a whole tour because if people take time off work and, you know, get arranged childcare and all the things that my bandmates have to do to make this happen, and then one of us gets COVID and has to isolate, or if the venues close, or like anything could happen. So I'm kind of getting back to my, what got me started in the first place. Just me and the banjo and getting out the road in small rooms. Mm -hmm. um, because if something, if something gets screwed up, I can handle the disappointment alone a lot easier. I don't want to disappoint my bandmates. Um, you know, especially going to Europe, I'll be going to the UK in September, but it'll be solo again. So, you know, for the years leading up to the pandemic, I, it was almost all band work for me and we got tight and explosive. The current lineup of the band at the time was just banging. And I was like, yeah, we're going to get out there. And it felt like 2020 was going to be our year. And now here we are, and I'm sort of back to, I'm a folk singer again. But that's exciting in a way to me. It it feels like a very direct connection to the audience. I'm looking forward to Well, as someone who there. discovered you before you had the full American Circus, um, which I absolutely loved, and it was a great thing to see that you go into that, um, it's never been disappointing when it's just you alone. And uh, as you said in our first interview, like your inclination is to like, well, you're on stage. I'm going to earn it. I'm going to do things yeah. to keep in. And I love, you know, what you, what I do, do now with music too is just like realizing like Deb and I are an item as far as musicians. And it's as much as the music we play is like, you know, why we're playing the songs and that we, you know, we're playing songs when we cover something, it's like, well, we feel this way towards each other and the audience feels mm -hmm. that, um, and, and learning their stories and connecting with them. And that was some of the things I really enjoyed revisiting in that interview with you is, is what you dig about live performance. It's like, yeah, that's what I'm really, really digging about it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that I think perhaps the pandemic has, taught us we really needed is the basic fact of a live performance is this particular combination of people at this particular moment in their lives in this particular room can never be repeated. Every moment on stage is a completely non-fungible, right? Um, like it cannot ever be uh, repeated and, you know, you can, you can do all the same moves and sing all the same notes, even in the same room, but this group of people isn't going to be there. And even if you did somehow get this exact group of people together, their lives are going to be different. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, uh, it's a very special, a very special moment every every one of those uh that you kind of owe it to people to go why are we in the room together why am i singing this song to you why why are you reacting this way you got to be got to be on your toes taking care of people you know <laughs> I do not have to worry Because I know what's in store When angels crowd around And cast their shadow on my door There will be no sorrow When they call the final dance I don't mind because I made arrangements in advance. I left instructions for my payroll with the camera crew. I 
Take me down to MGM. They'll know what to do. Tell these Hollywood angels the time has come to gather round. And there will be no sweeter sound. I want Marlene Dietrich sing Lily Marlene. When they send me down to the front line And if it's got the brain Well, I want a Gene Kelly dancing So I can rise above my fear Hey, look, the gang's all here That's calling my friend up To wash away my blue I guess the Williams drinking champagne By the swimming pool Hey, that's Rudy Valley Singing in that sweet baritone Somebody get on the phone and get me Hollow marks up on the fence stand I need a Hollywood miracle A brand new show A Busby birthday funeral When I go Speaking of, of taking care of people, um, how's it been, you know, uh, talking to you the first time I, uh, we went into your history with your father and growing up with a man who was running a little circus in town and, yeah, and yeah. had all this affection for these these circus performers that you, you were exposed to. And then, you know, that led you into this world in a very like, you know, you know, if we're going to like... Tra track your trajectory like that's definitely like sending you off in a direction so yeah sure um how is your your do you see your daughter like looking at that and picking that up i'm finally getting that with my kids my two boys are really excited for the next carnival to my son wants to create a dj personality to do a thing oh, great. acts and they want to referee the feats of strength and be my heralds and minions and i had to remind them like I didn't say trademark. That is stupid. Right. But like I, that word still has a meaning. <laughs> <laughs> they can't take it from us. Damn it. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my kid, uh, is, well, she was a gymnast for when she was little for years. And she got to the point where, 
to continue. It was going to be 20 hours a week and homeschooling and driving. To, and she was like, I don't want to do just this. I want to do, I want to be a kid. I want to do a bunch of stuff. So she dropped the gymnastics, but she had all that physical. And my dad taught gymnastics as well. So that kind of goes through the family history. Um, you know, that was a large part of my dad's circus was acrobatics and uh, aerial work. So my kid's really, for the last few years, been a dancer. She's gone hardcore into the dance scene. Um, and, I mean, another victim of the pandemic was one of the things she was doing was uh, this thing called Triangle Circus Arts. Uh, where I live here in Carolina is called the Triangle because it's Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. And it was acrobatics and aerial work and trapeze work and juggling and that. And she was really into it. And But that place didn't survive the pandemic. So that's a bit sad because that really felt... You know, I got to go to the circus arts place with my dad when he came and visited and we watched Daisy doing, you know, her routines and, you know, really felt like, wow, there's three generations of circus uh, craziness going on. But the, you know, I probably since the last I've talked to you, the last few years here, I've, uh, the, the, one of the singers in my band, Stacy, runs a dance company called The Bipeds, which she brought me into. So I've gotten very tight with the the local dance scene, you know, like contemporary, like weird modern stuff. Because <laughs> um, I thought, you know, they need banjo music in their lives. And so my daughter is well into dance as well. So that, I mean... You've seen my show. It's pretty physical. Um, so I think it's kind of a natural outgrowth. So I don't know if I've answered your question or if I've wandered off. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. I was just curious if you're seeing that, like, oh, she's kind of picking up the torch. like, And it sounds like, yeah, it's like uh, it, whether or not, you know, it's sad to hear that the venues aren't there. But as long as her, you know, interest is there. That's the thing that's cool to see. Um, my, my, my sons have like, there are these weird, like they've, they've taken up these aspects of, of my wife and I personality, but I see like one is really into performance. The other one's really into coding. <laughs> ah, and, wow. Yeah. I mean, every kid's totally different. We only yeah. have one daughter, so I don't have that difference to look at, but but they both I mean, love from, the silliness of of like the opportunity to like play on stage, and I love like showing yeah. them that like, hey, you can you want to do something like come up with a magic act, come up with a a joke or whatever. You know, if I'm putting on a show, it's it's here for you, and it's fun to have them be able to you know bring them in on that. So that's great. I mean, Daisy's 15 now. Whoa, never. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, never. I mean, she very little. She kind of played the ukulele and whatnot, but uh, really, it's been physical performance for her yeah. from very young age, which just shows you know it's built in. It comes with that monkey, you know. They just have it in them, and she was immediately very agile and very sophisticated physical. Uh, you know, we're relating to the world in that way. And, um, I'm glad it's moved into dance for her because it's more creative than, uh, gymnastics got to be a bit. Yeah. Like you uh, said, that's a real commitment and you're, you're also committing to like altering your body physically permanent. Yep. Uh, someone actually, um, there was a, uh, some social media post I saw that, was talking about um, trans issues and, and pushing back on like, how can you let a child like start deciding their gender expression, you know, and things like that. It's like, we don't have that conversation about 
you know, do you stop and talk to your kid about, okay, you want to do gymnastics. You realize this is going to like, you're going to look different. This is your pie. Like it's, it's, it's almost as like, and and the person was coming from someone who did it and dance or ballet is actually what the post was about. And it's like, do you sit down with your child and have that conversation as deeply as you think you, you need to about this thing, which is, yeah. I mean, there was one kid when she was really little in gym, when she was in gymnastics, there was one little boy. And this is a very instructive moment for me about gender things. Um, this one little boy who was great at gymnastics and, but kind of awkward and shy and not shy, but just, uh, just seemed kind of different, expressed himself in a different way and was really great at gymnastics, but had outstripped the level of all the boys' gymnastics. So he was starting to do the girls' classes because they were at a higher level. And then this kid at, I don't remember what age, but young decided I'm not a boy. This is not who I am and had thankfully very supportive parents. And the next time I saw that kid a couple of years later, she was confident and happy. And I was like, this makes all the sense. I'd never seen both sides. I've never known somebody that went through it. And I was like, this is right. What this kid has chosen and the support that the parents are giving, it was amazing. It was an amazing transformation. And this kid is to, well, I'm not close with them, but outwardly a very happy kid, way more. And so as you say, you, you know, the the – the person, the person knows itself better than the other people, right? We we know we know who we are. I think. And I see, you know, what we, you know, I'm kind of talking about like, um, you know, with uh, with my kids, I feel like my responsibility is to show them these are all the possibilities of things you can do. Like, are you yeah. into? coding are you into performance are you into music are you into dance are you into sports whatever and it's no different with showing them like well who are you how do you want to occupy your skin and what affectations feel right to you and allow you to fully be yourself and if that's like occupying a more feminine space that's fine there's nothing and children are better off just like if you want to be really good at banjo or violin or anything, if you find that thing earlier, you're way better off at being the best yeah. at that thing, fully that thing. And it's no different. I know, yeah, parents who've had very young kids and the process for them too is like, A, people think like, oh, you're going on these blockers. It's like that's re- – A, it's not a big problem. Those you can go off of. And, you know, when people fixate on the mechanics of it or whatever, and it's like it's really about the yeah. expression. And a lot of people don't do all kinds of surgeries and this and that, but you are, if you prohibit someone who knows that's what they are from an early age. And then even if they're, when they break free of that repressive family and do it later, they've grown into a male body because of. It's a different thing. And it's rougher and it's cruel. I mean, we change our, I mean, it's interesting. You saying that we do change our bodies, like, you know, dance or, you know, ballet or gymnastics, but even, even something as simple as playing the banjo all my life. I mean, I'm the different side of my body is stronger and I have injuries on one side of my body that make me do a different thing. And my, my hands are shaped weird because of it. And, you know, there's a million things that we do that alter our bodies every, you know what I mean? Look at Keith Richards' <laughs> gnarled fingers and tell me, you know what I mean? <laughs> so 
So I, you know, that's, you know, we, we get a body and you do, you do what you want to it, you know, <laughs> little things are big things. It's, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I know all these dancers and then like, I know a bunch of people now because of the choreographer I'm working with, who's like runs a Pilates studio. And so those people can immediately look at people and say, you are so H symmetric. You need to, <laughs> you know, like musicians are all like hunched over in really weird ways. Like musicians are not symmetrical objects anymore. They're completely, they're like trees that have like grown around a rusted out car or something. Cause you know, the banjo or the tuba has been like embedded in the bark. <laughs> like there's nothing to be done about it. You know, you just find it 20 years later. Everybody knows all about my heart, where it ends and where it starts. They know all about my heart. And there's that song again, playing just for me, a poison a melody, a silver drop of mercury. Like a Berlin ballad Familiar to my ear But there's a shadow and a harmony Confusion and fear And that sweet refrain Sweet sugar cane Is only a poison melody Like they did when you were young And that sweet refrain Like a ball and chain Waiting in the chorus for me Oh, can't you see that sweet refrain Only a poison, only a poison. 
gone through quite a journey. Uh, last time I interviewed you, you know, I kind of round things out, wanting to get into um, some of the things you feel strongly about with like, like politics and, and the, and the, you know, you know, like we talked about uh, getting to play uh, way steep in the big muddy Pete Seeger's song for Pete yeah. Seeger in New York um and still doing that song yeah like almost every night songs not you know like as it's 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 fascinating like you know i think i mentioned too that one of my songs has got like some detailed political things that motivated it but it's the song is open it's about anything um yeah and but it continues to be relevant about other situations and Having gone now since the last time I talked to you, we were, you know, in Obama. I don't think Trump was even on the horizon as a possibility. Um, so we've gone mm-hmm. through Obama, through Trump, and we're in Biden, and Trump's on the horizon again. And I'm just curious how, you know, how are, we can just have a free form thing about like, you know, where's where's this putting you in a place of like. Uh, the times are these, these are definitely times we need a banjo man. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I feel like we're up against some things that might be even (laughs) beyond a banjo player to fix. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) I think think it's gotten that bad. (laughs) I mean, that used to be all it took, but um, this was supposed to be a hopeful interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, really, I have gotten troubled by how people keep saying, wow, your songs really predicted all of this. And I'm like going, you know, yeah, if you, if you, if your lyrics say, well, everything's about to explode and everybody's going to starve and, you know, it's all coming crashing down, you will always seem prescient, you know, because um, that just seems to keep hitting. Well, I, you said in our last interview that like when we were t- I was saying uh, how presidents are a central character in a lot of your songs richard nixon abraham yeah. lincoln whatever and you you said like well when you evoke a president it puts you in a time and a place and there's the timeless aspect of like anyone who wants that job is probably you know uh, not a good person and insane i believe is the quote yeah and i the think the it's problem a- that i i've seen in my you know watching politics going from like starting to pay attention under bush and then seeing Obama right. and then Trump and then Biden is on what keeps flipping is on both sides of the this the, these camps people have have carved out is like this is these are the political terrain, you know, Republicans and Democrats. They both forget that fact. And the president is unscrupulous and psychotic. <laughs> Uh, yeah. once their team is in charge, like we see that now with Biden. Now he's a, he's a good, and, and I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but as for me, like over the right. years now, my, I think since I met you, like now, like I very strongly, like the only political identity I feel comfortable claiming is an anarchist because it's not a left, right, right axis of power it uh, or of a left, right axis of how I decide what's going to happen. It's e- your economic yeah, the more power you have, the less I trust you. In a nutshell, certainly. I mean that that's definitely true in all societies that I know of. You know, the stronger the, and we're. I mean, we're just so because of the only left and only right idea that we have here. It's, it makes no it makes no sense. I mean, what would be considered a, what they're calling like the radical left in America would is kind of like middle right anywhere else, you know, in Europe or something. Um, we don't really have a, le- a left that has any real power here, and and the right is. 
you know, I, boy, I mean, Woody Guthrie's guitar is uh, pretty needed right now. I mean, it, it's just, I feel like we're headed towards like a fascist. Well, that's what I've seen in my lifetime is the Democrats have just kept becoming more like Republicans in pursuit yeah. of a vote. Like when Obama was elected, they didn't see that as a mandate to let's do some progressive or anything resembling leftist policies. They said, well, let's walk a line. Let's not, first of all, try Bush for any war crimes because we don't want to alienate those Republicans that did cross over for Obama. Let's keep those. So the Democrats right. like then they're the you know and and Clinton did this too. Let's let's work towards catering to the right because the left is just our our like they'll do whatever we need them to. We can just cudgel them into like we're taking it for granted and yeah. taking for granted. And so the that's what the seen the Democrats do is become more like Republicans. And then the Republicans are like, well, cool, we can just keep moving to the right and become yeah. more uh, embrace the fascism. You know that it is that they were on a trajectory to do in terms of how they perceive power, and that's what disturbed me about the Bush administration and the their supporters and the rhetoric of the right was seeing like, wow, they're really embracing things like the executive, uh, you know, um, theories of executive um, uh, privilege, like where it's just like the, what the president can do and then war and this and that. And then yeah, well, the Obama get elected and do the same things, but the Democrats were like, it's no, we got to trust him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he kept all of, they kept in place all of those executive expansions that happened in the Republican years. You know, in the Clinton years, they expanded it, and then Bush expanded it wildly, and then Obama just kept it that way, maybe even expanded it more. And then you give that much power to, like, the worst possible creature that America can imagine
I'm, I've been disappointed with my the nation's people, you know? Like, I, I can't believe, like, J Jamie and I, and my wife and I, having lived in New York, we knew anybody that's lived an hour in New York knows Trump and Giuliani, and it's like, if you're going to throw democracy away, if you're going to just chuck it in the dumpster and be done with it, that's your fucking guy? That's the guy you're going to... You know, like, that's who you're throwing it all away for? Is Donald Trump. A joke of a person. It's just the worst. And it's almost like he was like a, a host body. You know, like one of those, like, you know, zombie wasp things or something like they just they just filled his body with all these authoritarian he was a perfect avatar he was an avatar and i think i mean my view of politics now doing you know journalism and um honestly as someone who was just always like a political junkie where i just would read what's going yeah. on in in these high, in the high level of the you know the clouds of the senate and what's the president doing and that was my yeah, yeah. that was my preoccupation with news and becoming a journalist really weaponized that compulsion like now i'm paying attention to something horrible um but it's something that no one knows about and i i'm bring it to light but you even on the ground level now where i've looked at poli like politicians and just kind of see them for what they are is like these people who love the attention. They love telling the story. They love feeling like a big deal and, and they will do, you know, whoever's going to pay them to keep them doing it. And there's yeah. so many, so many easy ways so many, um, for strings to be pulled And this country has never had a full reckoning. Um, like, you know, we're living in a false consciousness on a lot of levels about the, the, power and uh, machinations of our intelligence agencies in manipulating, you know, you know, and manipulating the democratic process. That's why he's, you know, one of my things where it's like, I maintain optimism in people. I don't be like, well, I can't believe we people, the American people did this is I do look yeah. at how manipulated all of our systems are um, on so many levels, like, you know, what you're brought up to believe about America, if you just go through the status quo education system, mm -hmm. all the way up to the college level, like the things that are like the myths that are propagated, the orthodoxies that are imposed on lawyers or, uh, you know, um, people who are going into political science. And like, this is the range of acceptable discussion and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's where I, you know, I'm like, it is, you know, I, I, I try, I, I do think powerful people, evil, awful, awful, awful people. Yes. I have a dark, dark view of humanity. The more power you, you put into people's hands and the more secrecy they can maintain yeah. as they have power. Um, I don't yet have the cynicism about your average person, even like, oh my God, that person voted for Trump. Cause I get disturbed by liberal rhetoric where they're like, well, if we just got rid of all these Republican voters, like this soft yeah. genocidal talk that will come out of liberals, I know. And cause they're like, yeah. oh, it's these voters are just the problem. It's like, oh, and they're your neighbors and they have been misguided and you can't be um, elitist about that because you, you're probably misguided on some things too. Of course. Yeah. I mean, the, the big change that I noticed early on in this era, I was, you know, I, I sing to everybody in all manner of things and all manner of places and situations. And it's not hard to tell where my Paul, political mind is, you know, if you listen to lyrics, but I don't know. I, the example I always have is I used to, I, there's a little bar that I like to play in Arlington, Virginia. It's called the galaxy hut. It's a tiny little place. Um, I've been playing there for 20 years, but back in sort of the, like the Bush years. And because I would play there and I do my show as I do. And 
there was a group of Republican lawyer types. They used to go there because they lived in Arlington and that's where they went for a drink. And they found the show funny and they knew the historical references and they would like heckle me a little bit. They would go, you know, you commie or whatever. And I would go, keep it down, you fascist. And like, it was funny. And we were engaged in the same thing. And then after the show, I would have a drink with them and we talk about, you know, well, what was that historical thing you said? And I would go, well, you know, that's kind of bullshit, <laughs> you know, and we would be able to have a conversation and be friends and go, well, don't you think it could be this way? No, don't you think it? But we, you know, there was no, like, we are not Americans or you're not American. And I had a lot of that kind of thing. I had plenty of people that didn't agree with my stances on things, but they liked my show and they liked the lyrics and they could tell that things were smart. But then in 2017, after Trump won, I was going back to New York. It happened to be the weekend of, do you remember the Women's March? Yeah, yeah. Um, it happened to be that weekend. So I went out and did that march or whatever. But I had shows in Brooklyn and Queens. And somebody wrote to me, like an email, said, uh, or Facebook maybe, said, hey, I, uh, I've been a fan of your music for years, but I never have seen you live um, because you moved away before I... Uh, discovered you or whatever, but I have, he said, I have all your records and I'm so excited that you're coming into town and I'm going to come and I'm planning to come to your show in Queens and bring my friends and family. But I have to know right now, are you going to be spouting off about our great new president? Because if you are, I'm not coming and I'm telling everyone not to go. That's a tough, and, I was and like, they call the liberals snowflakes. <laughs> Yeah, and I said to him, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I don't feel comfortable giving you assurances that I won't say something you don't agree with. That could very well happen. You know my lyrics. You know my performance style. It's just a risk you're going to have to take. <laughs> you might disagree with something I say, but that shouldn't prevent this and he goes i'm sorry i'm sorry to uh that you feel that way i can't i can't support this and it, that is a huge difference in how the country how anomalous and that, how anomalous was that and i mean i i got a lot of that another thing that'll be very funny way long ago in like the obama years I wrote some songs about Nixon, as you know, because I just find like Nixon mm -hmm. and Elvis are sort of like the two little angel and devil on your shoulders, you know, is how I think of it. And it's funny, I, more than once, people have, I start singing about Nixon and it'll throw people into a rage now. And there was even one club here in Durham where I'm playing and... After the show, my friend said, somebody lost it completely when you started singing about Nixon. I was like, what? And he said, and he, he goes, this, this goddamn guy's singing about Nixon. Just completely, I mean, what's the word I'm looking for? Just losing his mind over it and uh, demanded his money back from the place and demanded to see the management and lodged a formal complaint with the venue. And that was it. And wrote like a long thing on Facebook and put it on their page. Like, and because he didn't see it as me singing about Nixon or singing about America or something historical, he just automatically went, he's calling Trump Nixon. And I'm like, 
I would never do such a thing because Nixon was much smarter. Maybe you want to think Trump. about why your brain made that connection, man. <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel like the whole country has turned that way, right and left. You know, I feel like, uh, I feel like everybody has, um, well, I get frustrated now with like twice in a row watching, you know, first with Bush and I was like on with it. It was like all of the liberals and people who think that being a Democrat is a political ideology. It's not. Yeah. Um, but that would just dunk on Bush and righteously be like, this is, you know, enough and, 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 and March. And then Obama comes along and they just shut down or whatever. And then Trump and, and, you know, watching it now happen again and again. And, um, it is. And that, yeah, that's the key thing is, like I said, is like being a Democrat is not a political ideology and liberal isn't either. Like most, it's a very soft thing to identify and it, it does have a meaning, but most people haven't adopted it more than they think. It's like these set of things I want or I'm cool with, then yeah, I'm liberal or whatever. Then the Democrat yeah. Democratic Party is the only home for me. Yeah, that's the problem with this supposed left and right thing. I, it, I mean, I I don't feel like I have a a home. Uh, at least on national politics. I mean, that's not where it's at anyway, yeah. right? It's it's all in your town. Um, and that's the thing I've preached the gospel of the most. I mean, I think I always, it's an, you know, I kind of to button up things too. Like I started this endeavor podcasting at all because I was like, this is, there's really great grassroots, local yeah. level, like under your nose musicians. Like you were, you were one of the higher up of most of the people I've had, like where you're like, you've played in a lot of places and you're touring. Um, but I mean, a lot of the musicians are like this person that goes to plays this local bar on the regular and will come to this open mic, like take a look at them. It's amazing. And, and yeah. now with reporting on all like local stories of wrongful prosecutions or police abuse or prosecutorial misconduct, right. same thing um compels me to like preach that pay attention to the local because it's your roi you know your return on your interest uh is so much more uh valuable to that local issue or right. that local race or this local tragedy or that local musician you tell people listen to their music, you buy their CD, you pay attention to them. That matters yeah. so much more than if you're, you know, you make it your priority to be on board with the latest X ubiquitous artist. Right. Whatever Pitchfork is pushing or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I mean, this is all exactly what I was saying. Like, who are you in the room with? You know, as a musician, who am I in the room with? what's this night going to be like? Same thing with the audience, you know, what be there, <laughs> you know, um, engage with the people around you and the person on stage. Same thing goes for politics or, or, you know, any of these things, you know, who's, who's in your town, who, who are you, you know, who's in traffic with you, who's at the coffee shop, who's, you know, it's, um, I kind of feel like obsessing too much over Donald Trump or Joe Biden is kind of like saying Harry Styles means more to me than charming disaster, you know, <laughs> it's sort of um, to me, it's sort of kayfabe at this point. It's like people who take wrestling and think it's real. <laughs> You pay a lot of attention to it. It's like, okay, Joe Biden is the hero and Trump was the heel, but it's all feels a bit like, they know how things are going to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my, my tunes, maybe have gotten, there are no presidents in any of the newer material. <laughs> like, well, I mean, that's not true. I wrote a Christmas song about Richard Nixon. So, <laughs> um, but, 
most of the stuff I've been writing for the last couple of years has been uh, a little bit more personal in some respect and definitely sadder. And, uh, you know, I'm singing about, a, you know, Laurel and Hardy and uh, Lillian Lietzel. So my, I got a new song about this aerialist who uh, um, she was like the most famous circus performer. She died in 30, I forget what year, 36 or something like that. Fell, you know, in her act. And, uh, you know, I grew up with pictures of her. So I don't know. I, it, a lot of, I have all these photographs. You know, a picture of Laurel and Hardy and a picture of Lillian Lietzel and a picture of this, you know, a painter looking in a mirror in 1918. And so I've been kind of like trying to inhabit those, those images and find the people inside of them and sing from their point of view, um, which is about as personal as my songwriting really gets. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I feel like my mission is a bit different now, you know what I mean? Um, or maybe I'm just getting old, <laughs> but like, I, I kind of want to go, Hey, look at these tiny things, you know, don't, uh, you know, I used to have this like camera that would sort of like drop down from the clouds and like see you know you know and there's abraham lincoln and there's elvis presley and that is what you need to know about america and richard nixon is coming for you and it was like the camera was like an aerial shot that then moved in on people's faces and now i'm kind of trying to write songs where i start with a close-up like right on somebody's face, whether it be the circus performer or, you know, the silent film actor or whoever it is, like right in their face, what's their feeling? And the camera pulls, pulls back. And it's only at the end of the song that you see the setting in which they are and what it means um, to the, to the whole scene, you know, trying to place people that way. And maybe that's because of uh, all the alone, lonesome time we, we, we had, you know, um, at the beginning of this uh, pandemic era that we're in. <laughs> this time the dream is a Russian oil tanker. And a Cuban shoe cane About Richard Nixon is having the same old nightmare Jack Ruby's black secret crawling up through the drain So if William Tecumseh Sherman and the Union Army Savannah, just let it fall Because even if they burn up all that confederate money You're gonna find that rebel engine right where it's stalled Well, one of these days the soil's gonna give out And the harvest moon 
When I stepped into doing journalism initially, I was my first story was a fluke that kind of landed in my lap. And then I was like, how do you, yeah. how do you find stories? And it was the summer of George Floyd. So I was like, I'm just going to oh, yeah. go to protests. And that's when I found like you will find news and you also find somewhat other places that were established that would cover the same thing I was at. They'd rush to break the news. And after I read what they wrote, I was like, oh, it's someone's job to fix the news. <laughs> Because yeah, they right. missed a lot of details and yeah. maybe didn't emphasize things that I thought were really important. But eventually what I've nestled into now is like I started focusing on singular stories of like some one person being not like yeah. writing this like, let me tell you about how broken all of Ohio is. Like if I tell you this one person's story, you'll understand how broken the media, the way it covers uh, things is you'll understand how broken the court system was and the trial system, how broken the yeah. prosecutor is. And then I'm at the point now where I have people coming to me out of the blue, writing me. Sometimes now there's someone I'm talking with that's in jail. And I tell them like, mm -hmm. I don't have a big platform. I've <laughs> um, I'm tr and I'm, I, I like doing this work, but just, you know, have you tried to tell this to anyone else? You know, like either, yes, they have, or they, they don't see anyone that, that will go at it. But telling these small stories shows these major fault lines in the whole system. And yeah, I mean, you learn the most from that and every, and any piece of art or journalism, I would think, you know, what, what are your, I don't know. Even like, even the great big songwriters, you know, like Bob Dylan or whatever, you know, like he'll sing about Hurricane Carter, you know, he'll sing about that boxer and just tell that story. And then that tells you everything you need to know about like race and policing and, and the jur jury system in the country, you know, and that's what Woody Guthrie was all along woody guthrie never went you know and america is you know what i mean he would go he would tell you about you know you know an individual person and Yeah, I mean, I'm always talking about Pete Seeger, too, but, like, you know, his thing was, like, you're singing with him, and that's very valuable, too. Like, 
Um, there's too many people giving speeches and not enough people having conversations. And I think that's what a, the best musical performance is having a conversation, not giving a speech. And I think most musicians get up and go, this is the prepared speech I have. This is how it goes. I hope you like it. As though it's a presentation, like a PowerPoint or something. And I'm like, going, you need to have the ability to like, Put a question in their head. Yeah, and go off script and go, I was going to sing to you about Elvis, but you actually need to hear the story about Sonny Liston instead. So let me change course and go, do you know who Sonny Liston was? It's like, well, no, we don't. And it's like, well, have you seen that picture of Muhammad Ali standing over the wiped out body of the guy on the canvas? And it's always the picture of victory. That's Ali kicking ass. That's Ali, the victor. And then you go, well, who's the guy on the floor? Who is that? And it's like, that's Sonny Liston. And he was considered an unbeatable monster. And so then I started reading about him. And his story is amazing and heartbreaking and tells you so much as much as Ali's story. Ali is one of my heroes, you know? And, but then Sonny Liston was this heavyweight champion, but he, he was not supported. He was kind of like a, a criminal, you know, the mob kind of used him to break legs and stuff like that when he was young and nobody loved the guy. I always talk about this before I sing the song. Like, even his mother doesn't know when he was born. She's like, I think it was, you know, 33, maybe, something like that. Like, she doesn't even quite know the year of when he was born. All we know is that Sonny existed at some point, and he died alone in a hotel room, I think. And... The only reason they knew he died was the newspaper stacked up outside of his door. And somebody said, why isn't he getting his papers? And they went in and they found him dead. So nobody really knows when he died either. He just sort of passed through the world. And, you know, when he was heavyweight champion, nobody, when he won the championship, nobody came to the airport to meet him when he came home. There was nobody to go, well done, Sonny. So he was just this person that was hated. And even the NAACP didn't want him to win the championship because they said, that's not the person we want representing. It's just a heartbreaking tale. And... He was really into blues music, and he was really into James Brown. Night Train was his favorite song. That's what he used to train to. And he said, you know, Ali gets credit for being the poet of the boxing world, right? But Sonny Liston wasn't a super articulate guy, but he was smarter than they gave him credit for. And he said this thing. He said, Someday they're going to write a blues just for fighters. It will be slow guitar, soft trumpet, and a bell. And I was like, that is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. So I was like, if I can just write a tiny song about that. And that's just taking a moment to take your eyes off of Ali and look at the guy on the floor and tell his story. And that tells you about, about love and race and murder and crime. And, you know, it, it tells such a huge story and people don't really know it that much, you know? So I kind of feel like those are the songs that I've been singing lately. I'm sorry, that was a very long story. I didn't mean to... Uh...
Well, not at all. And I'm, I'm going to be closing out this episode with uh, Sonny, Sonny Liston's song and um, directing everybody to check out curtiseller.com for tour dates. Uh, go to curtiseller.bandcamp.com to download all the songs. Uh, yeah. uh, listen for free. And more importantly, read the lyrics. It's I, I was doing that in preparation for this, and I still haven't decided what songs are going where in this interview. Oh, right, yeah. um, and I figured, you know, the some of them will come up as we're talking, like one just did. And um, but I'm excited to, you know, it's funny all. that the Sonny Liston song. I think he gets a mention in one of my old songs. Um, but I've written a new song that's just about him. That's slated for the new record. Oh, okay, so I know, like you've mentioned him in another song before. Yeah, I feel like there's a song about. Robert E. Lee. Yeah. That somehow mentions. Is that right? Yeah. Is that the one? I'm, I think there's a song about Robert E. Lee that mentions. Yeah, it sings about that photograph, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I knew I'd heard you sing about that I- I- uh, imagery, but I'm excited I to know he's getting a whole song <laughs> that I have. Yeah. Like, see, it just it yeah. sounded so much like you have so many great songs uh, that I'm like, that sounds like maybe I've heard that already. <laughs> right. So, well, I get I get obsessed with certain uh, certain characters and eras, you know. Um, one of my favorite ones, too. I wish I had this. I mean, I could maybe send you videos of these new ones. I don't know if the audio is good enough, but uh, I've been talking about Laurel and Hardy a little bit. Mm-hmm. And do you know them very much? Little, you know uh, just to know of them in like a general, like, you know, probably yeah, little more like than a millennial greatest... would, but about as right. Gen X or but, does. <laughs> they're like the greatest comedy duo ever, you know, with the, here's another nice mess you've gotten us into. I didn't mean it, Dolly. But then they were together and, um, Laurel is the skinny one and he was kind of the brains of the outfit. He wrote all the stuff and after Oliver Hardy died, he died young, uh, 56, I think. And Stan Laurel said, I'm not gonna make any more movies. I'm never going to go on stage again. Cause that was my partner. That was who I'm supposed to be you know it's like the beatles you know what i mean he's like if george is gone there's no beatles or whatever so it's like stan and ollie once ollie was gone stan's like i'm not gonna do it and he never did he spent the rest of his life answering fan mail and you know you know playing with kids and stuff and and they were also best friends in real life um it wasn't just a professional partnership you know, their families had barbecues together and they were, they were, he was his best friend. So when he died, it broke him up. And then after Stan Laurel died, when they were going through his things, they found notebooks of Laurel and Hardy routines that he had continued to write for the rest of his life that were never meant to be performed or filmed. And it was just his private way of keeping that friendship alive. And nobody knew it. He never shared it with anybody. So I've got a new song about that. And so that and the Sonny Liston are kind of these moments I'm talking about of a close up on somebody's face, you know, Stan Laurel is sad. He's lost his friend and we can all relate to losing a friend right now i think having lived through what we've just lived through and you know close up on sunny liston he's like why do they love ali and hate me you know if you get a close up on those people Mm -hmm. and then understand them and then pull the camera back then you realize the whole setting is Hollywood and Washington DC and Las Vegas and you see the whole picture but I don't know now I'm just yakking I don't know <laughs> Joe Lewis was a boxer 
Joe Joe Lewis was heavyweight champion of the world back in the 1930s. There are obvious athletic reasons why that is an impressive feat. But it was more impressive because in the 1930s in America, they did not let black people, African American we say, they didn't let them fight white people. At least not in a sanctioned sort of official sense. Because there was a guy named Jack Johnson in the 1890s, another African American guy, a very proud and outspoken and flamboyant character, a rock star we call him today. He always wore like fur coats and drove sports cars. And he kicked the shit out of everybody stupid enough to get in the ring with him for years and years and years. Undefeatable. When he finally aged out of the sport, they said, no more black guys, please. And then in the 1930s, here comes Joe Lewis. Charming young man from my hometown, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> I like what happens when I say Detroit. <laughs> you like two people sort of reluctantly going. <laughs> Joe Lewis had a bright smile and a winning personality. He always wore a nicely tailored suit, but in a sort of forgettable color. He always drove a sports car. Slow. In the 30s. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't really understand the question, but yes. Uh, his answer. Um, he never had his photograph taken with a white woman. <clears throat> Joe Lewis did not seem like a threat. So they said, you know. Let the kid fight, what harm can it do? We didn't guess what happened, right? He kicked the shit out of everybody stupid enough to get in the ring for years, years and years. And the thing is, he had punched in the head until he had passed out, but he had like a smile for you. <laughs> and he always looked good doing it. It's magnanimous. Everybody loved Joe Lewis. It's a much different story than Jack Johnson. If you were a young African American kid from Philadelphia or Detroit or Oakland, California or Kansas City, Missouri or Lennington Spa, <laughs> Joe Lewis was like. Superman and the President of the United States and Jesus Christ all rolled up into one. But he looked a little bit like you. And you got to punch people in the head until they fell down. Everybody loved him. They made comic books about him. They, you know, had him on newsreels. During World War II, they said, we're going to win. Because Joe Lewis is on our side. And you know what happened, right? We fucking won! Hey! <laughs> yeah, before you get too down on the United States of America, I think it was your idea. The whole country. Knocked out Hitler's favorite boxer. Anybody know his name? 
Yeah, you know, there's always like two or three creepy dudes in every room. You know, the answer to that question, I can see it coming. <laughs> We got Joe Lewis knocking out racism and knocking out fascism and just being an all around motherfucker. There was a time in history when there were more songs written about Joe Lewis than any other human being except for Jesus. Pretty cool, right? Sadly, this is not a song about Jones. <laughs> This is a song about the first person to ever get executed in the gas chamber in the state of North Carolina. And this is a feel-good number. <laughs> yeah. I promise if you do exactly as you're told, you're going to feel better about yourself and the person next to you and just mankind in general. But you got to do exactly as you're told. Because a great deal of joy comes from blind obedience. So here's the story that I heard. In 1936, in the state of North Carolina, on death row, they were making a switch from the electric chair to the gas chain. And they wanted to find out if it was inhumane. The cruel. You see, we come from a nation where gassing someone to death is not all that cruel. <laughs> so what they did is they found some young black kid who had committed some infraction. And they brought him into the gas chamber. Told him to have a seat. And they put a microphone in with him see what his last words were going to be. Was he going to call out for his mother? Or his father? The President of the United States? Maybe something higher up together? It's not a surprise to you, because I know you've heard me tell this story before. <laughs> Or maybe I've just been broadcasting my punches, as they say. But it was a tremendous uh, surprise to the people in the room that day when this kid's last words were saved, Joe Lewis. Saved.